Hey there, it's Katie Jarvis with Managing the Mess. And in this video, I'm gonna break down for you one of my students' favorite lessons. The type of lesson where the students are asking you nonstop once they see it in the hallway, when do we get to do that? Now, I like to do this lesson with either fifth or sixth grade because it has a high motivation factor. Students get to take a character that they already know and love, making sure that it is school appropriate, and they get to put their very own artistic twist on that character. I format my lessons by first going over the objective and then getting into any vocabulary. So I want my students to understand what does abstraction mean? So first I would start by explaining what realistic art is and break down that word that real is at the beginning of realistic. And I would give examples of also what non-objective art is, because that's also not what we're doing in this project. Non-objective art is when art is made on the elements or principles. It might be about line or color or shape, but it's not based on something real. Then we'll talk about abstraction, how an abstract artwork is based on something real, but the artist has changed it artistically. I have 10 abstraction techniques that I teach to my students. So to get across that vocabulary to them, I first am showing examples and explaining. I then have them go back and do a little bit of guided practice. So I have my example up on the board and they are to take an everyday object and abstraction in all these 10 different ways. In the first box, I just have students draw their object normal. Now for my example, I chose a pencil, but students are encouraged to choose something easy to draw, a basketball, a piece of pizza, an emoji, just something very easy and every day. I shy away from having the students do their character for this because they do have to do it 10 times and that would take them a lot of time. What I'm looking for here is just that understanding piece that they know what the choices are for abstraction. The second technique is to magnify. So really, if it was an iPad or an iPhone, just doing that little zoom in and seeing what would that object or character look like. The next one is to simplify. And I have a lot of students that choose this for the project. So I'll be putting up a lot of examples here on the screen, but you're just taking some parts out, but still making that character or object recognizable. Next is a fragment. And I explain this to my students as if it is a broken glass. So things are broken and fragmented, but it'd be really easy to slide the pieces and put things back together. The next one is scale. So scale would be size, but you know, compared to another object. So I have my students put something else in the picture. In my example, I've put an apple next to it. So you can realize that this is a very large pencil. The next technique is explode. And I have a couple examples of this with Bob the Builder and Hello Kitty that you can still tell what character it is but the pieces are just everywhere. It's not as neat as that fragment. Distort, I explain this to students as, imagine you take this object and you put it into the oven or the microwave and it just completely melted. So that's how I ended up with this wavy pencil. Rearrange is a fun one. And a lot of my students that choose SpongeBob love to do this instead of having his square pants on the bottom. They love to put it on the top or the side. What it really means is, is that you're just taking things and putting them into a different order. It kind of gives it a little Mr. Bit Hate Ahead type of a look. The next technique is morph. So this would be if you take the object and then change it into something else. So I've taken my pencil and turned it into a little pencil character. One of my favorite ones is that a student took Peppa Pig and they turned them into bacon. I have a fantastic example where a student took Garfield and made them into a sandwich. I love the Olaf where he has morphed into a puddle. And who doesn't like the Winnie the Pooh as a honey jar? Just adorable. Now, the last technique that I teach my students is multiply. And I haven't really had too many students choose this until this year um, for my examples. And that is, they're just taking that character or that object and just doing lots and lots and lots of them. So there's a high level of work on that one. So students tend to shy away from that when choosing it for the character. After the students complete the vocabulary word sheet using that basic object, I have them select a character. Now, when I've shared this online before, I've gotten a lot of questions about how did the students get the character inspiration? Now, I do go through and just find a lot of pictures online 
and laminate them so that there are things available for students. But I also send a quick message home to parents and I kind of give my students a heads up maybe the week before that we're going to be doing this character project. Now, what I give them the option of doing is bringing a little stuffed animal, a t-shirt, a sticker, you know, the front of a notebook, somewhere where they might have that character, a little image of them that could help them act as a reference for the project. Now, when they're choosing those characters, I let families and students know that it has to be something that's appropriate for kindergartners to view in the hallway. So we're not doing Five Nights at Freddy or Huggy Wuggy or anything super scary that's going to give me nightmares. Um, and that really works well so that students, if they have something that they are really motivated by, they can bring that little stuffed animal in um, and they've got that reference to look at. If they don't have something, then they can choose something that I am providing. I will also have them do a planning sheet. So um, on the back of the vocabulary sheet, you could put this where you're gonna have three squares and students are filling in what technique did they decide to use. And they could use more than one of the abstraction techniques for the characters, but which one do they wanna highlight? And I have them identify that and write that down and then draw a little rough sketch about what they're thinking to make. Now, this project is ultimately a collage, but I would say this whole planning step of doing the, the vocabulary words, planning out which character you're gonna do, and then how you're going to abstract them would take up the first class. Now I have hour long classes, so if you have 45 minutes or half hour, you definitely would need to adjust, but I think that takes enough to fill in that first day and to get students really excited about the project. Day two of the lesson, I would have that construction paper ready for students. So I cut paper 12 by 12 and provide lots of choices for the different colors. Now that 12 by 12 paper is going to become the background, but I also let students choose maybe up to two extra pieces if they need a lot of a color. Let's say they have a blue square for the background, but their idea is to make SpongeBob they might also need a large square of that yellow paper. And I'll have my scrap box stocked up and ready to go. My scrap box is simply um, two different milk crates, and then there are file folders inside. The file folders have a just small little sample of construction paper laminated and stapled to the file folder um, sticking up so that students can see what color is in each folder and I have two that are just identical. I organize them in rainbow order and then the colors that are not in the rainbow, the neutral colors are in the back. You'll want to talk with your students about good craftsmanship because they're going to be excited to jump right into this project and start making. But remind them when they're using those scissors to take big bites. I feel like fifth and sixth graders often are not doing all that cutting and snipping in their classroom anymore, and they take these little tiny bites. It ends up looking like a rat chewed it. So you may want to have an example of a um, circle that's cut out very neatly and glued down, and one that is a little bit more jagged and rough so that they can see that difference. Remind them that we should be hiding our pencil. Those pencil marks that we're making when we're drawing Snoopy's nose or making, you know, Scooby-Doo's ears, that's just for us. When we cut those things out, we want to glue it down so that we're hiding those pencil lines and we want to hide the glue. We don't want glue oozing out on this project. I do have my students use glue stick on this to just kind of alleviate some of the mess, but I'm showing for them what it looks like when there's a lot of extra glue stick on the paper that you can see. It ends up looking a little bit like snot. Um, and when it really should just be on the back of the object that's being glued, not all over the paper. I'll remind my students that when they tell me that they are done, that they need to hold their entire project upside down. Now, this is to do a little bit of a hallway test. Are pieces going to fall off? Is this artwork really fragile? If they can see things that are hanging, they have to get a little bit more glue and they need to do some surgery and some repairs so that artwork is ready to go and be displayed. I sure am hoping that you are excited and inspired to try this lesson this year with your students. To help you out a little bit, I have both my slides and my student printables available over on my Teacher Pay Teacher Store Managing the Mess. I hope that you will check that out. Now, I make videos just like this for our teachers just like you every single week. I want you to feel less alone in this crazy career and helping you to improve your classroom management to make your job easier. Check out this video next.